Hey everyone, my name is Shanice and welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today I am trying out kind of a new series um, where I revisit a book that I DNF'd or gave a one star or just generally didn't like. I'm gonna start this off with a book that I in fact DNF'd the year that it came out. Um, it's called Disorientation by Elaine Shea Chow. When I first read it or tried to read it, two years ago. I think I gave up around the 6% mark on my Kindle. I just found the writing kind of juvenile, more YA oriented. The character of Ingrid, who is the main character, the narrator, I found her to be very unbelievable. And I guess I found it so bad that I just gave up. Um, it's very rare when I do DNF books. I kind of like to give a book its fair chance um, and read it until the end. I think it's something that maybe I should change because there really isn't a point to continuing a book if I am not enjoying it um, or appreciating it or just am not vibing with it at all. And so you might be asking yourself, why pick it up again? Like, and also why now? Another fact about me is that even when I give up on a book or I end up not liking a book, there's something in me that wants to give it another shot um, that maybe in a different time I will enjoy it or understand it more. That happens each and every time I give a book a low rating. But when it comes to disorientation, the specific incidents that got me wanting to reread it is that I joined this reading group and one of the books that we read for the reading group was Real Americans by Rachel Kong which I ended up not really loving. Um, it was a major disappointment for me uh, and I you know just shared the opinion that the characters in that book were incredibly annoying in how they didn't think critically enough about race or interracial relationships specifically when it comes to one white partner one asian partner i just felt like the characters just sort of gave in too easily um and i voiced that opinion and one of the other members of that reading group um basically disagreed with me which is perfectly fine um but one of the examples that she gave as kind of a book that similarly deals with interracial relationships, um, Asian and white relationships, is Disorientation by Elaine Shea Chow, and also this more recent book called The Fetishist, which I haven't read yet, um, but she kind of used this book as an example of other characters who didn't really think about their relationships too critically because it was so exhausting and, you know, it's more about class than anything else. And, you know, I don't really fully agree with that kind of dismissal of what I said, um, but whatever, that's fine. But her comment made me kind of want to revisit disorientation because if beyond the 6% that I read that book actually does discuss this, then maybe I should see what Elaine is you know, trying to do because I highly doubt that that book would take that stance. I don't know, from, you know, what I've read, from people who do enjoy it, it's a satire on academia and aspirations to whiteness. So something just seemed off about this example that that other woman said. So it just made me really want to read this book or reread it, or at least try to reread it beyond six percent. And so surprisingly <laughs> this time around I really enjoyed this book. Um, I ended up giving it around 3.5 stars, more like a four stars, because I had a fun time reading this. Um, if you don't know what the book is about, it follows Ingrid Yang, who is a 29-year-old PhD student at a fictional Barnes University. She is in her eighth year of her PhD, and she in particular is studying the poetry of a made-up fictional author poet named Xiao Wen Chao. And she is stuck. She has no interest in completing her PhD or has any passion about her dissertation. In fact, 
she didn't really want to study Chow's poetry at all. She kind of felt pushed into it by more senior members of the East Asian Studies Department at her university. And so she's just kind of aimless, disillusioned. She has major, major writer's block. She has no idea what she is going to do to complete her dissertation, essentially. And she's flailing. She is engaged to a white man named Stephen, who himself is a Japanese to English translator, though he does not speak a lick of Japanese. Essentially, the novel follows Ingrid trying to make sense of what to do with her life given her current situation. It is told in a very satirical fashion. The writing is very humorous. I found it really funny. Uh, maybe some people would find it a little bit overwrought but I generally was laughing out loud at some parts. The book is satirizing a lot of things um, which is a strength and to me a bit of a weakness. Um, so it is definitely being highly critical of academia, of course, of the white canon in academia and even within departments that supposedly focus on more minority ethnicities. For example, the East Asian Studies Department. You know, things that I have always observed being a student and having gone to grad school and just the general populace of certain departments. Um, it's, it's striking how much of, you know, let's say the East Asian Department or the Middle Eastern Studies Department or the Latin American Studies Department is comprised of white students, which is not bad, but it is definitely curious and kind of a head scratcher. It makes you think, okay, why? What is behind this? Um, and so this book definitely touches on that. It touches on, like I said, disillusionment and the sense of being out of touch with one's own cultural identity, but how that often is a result of feeling like you have to fit in, um, which Ingrid certainly certainly suffers from. Um, Ingrid is generally a maddening character. She's completely frustrating. I know people of color who definitely think like her. Um, she has a big character arc, um, so I don't want to spoil anything, but let's just say when she begins, she is completely blindsided by race. She hardly thinks of it. She's uncomfortable really like saying the word white or black, you know, and I know a lot of people who are like this too. It's like saying black or white is like nerve wracking and instead they'll say Caucasian or African American, even though, you know, African American is completely specific to one country. Um, but people just don't realize it. And so Ingrid is like that, seems to feel comfortable in majority white spaces, but at the same time, is completely uncomfortable in them too. She's just in limbo. This book also touches on interracial relationships, of course. So Ingrid is Taiwanese American. Her boyfriend or fiance, Stephen, is white American. And from the get-go, I knew Stephen was a mess. I think in several videos, I have sort of rolled my eyes when I've mentioned like Megan McDowell translating a lot of Spanish language authors to English. I don't have anything against Megan McDowell, but it is so evident that the world of translation um, from other languages into English is very overpopulated by white translators. That's just a fact. Um, and again, there's nothing wrong with any of them <laughs> as people, as translators. There's nothing that diminishes their value with that fact, but it, it it's just, it's something that should probably make you think twice or make you at least wonder why. Um, and so Stephen, him being a Japanese to English translator who knows no Japanese, but is getting all the credit and all these awards. It's like, yeah, I definitely know or have heard of some real life examples there. So the book in general pinpoints with such specificity and bite these kind of examples of race of representation. Um, it definitely focuses on every character's flaws. Um, so while the satire is obviously a satire, where for me it fell into more of a weakness of the book is that I think for a satire to truly work, 
it needs a point of view. It's okay to criticize and analyze all points of view, which this book does. Essentially, no point of view is safe when Elaine Chow is writing. Um, she goes after leftist ideas, she goes after more right-wing ideas, she goes after social justice, she goes after colorblindness, she goes after just everybody. Everyone in this book is kind of a buffoon, but for me it kind of distracts from the satire in the end because if everybody is dumb, if everybody is kind of in the middle, no one is completely right, no one is completely wrong, the satire is kind of balanced, it's too balanced. Um, so I n kind of wanted to know where the author was leaning in some way. Um, in the end it was almost like, yeah well everyone is dumb and has flaws and I'm gonna mock them all. It's like, then why is this not just a realist fiction, you know? That is the real world, you know, everybody is flawed, everyone has good and bad. Um, why not just make it a realist book, you know? because you chose satire, why not be clear about the point of view that you're taking? So that is, you know, the one thing that I just kept noticing on every page, even though it was really fun and enjoyable and fast-paced and again, super funny. Um, but there were just some moments where it's like the satire of one thing would immediately clash with the satire of another point of view and I just kept getting confused. Like, what are we saying? <laughs> what are we trying to do here? Like what is the message I'm supposed to get out of this? Um, it just, it clashed and it was like a cacophony of opinions. Elaine Chow had characters in here that were saying what you would assume would be like the correct thing to say or do in those situations, but then later on those same characters would then be outed as a hypocrite or having espoused completely different points of view prior to their political changes. Pointing out the hypocrisy beyond just pointing at a character's humanity is almost like undermining the value of their change and their growth in identity and politics and all of that. It just, it was very confusing. I did love Ingrid's change by the end. It took like way too long for her to get there. And again, she's just such a frustrating character. Like I wanted to throw my book across the room sometimes at the stupidities that she would say as a person of color. But I'm glad she kind of sort of figured herself out by the end. Um, I'm glad Steven was dealt with as he should have been. <laughs> and so yeah, I am thrilled that I did give this book a second chance, but I will say now having read the book, I'm not entirely sure what that member of the reading group was even talking about. I'm not <laughs> sure this bolsters their point of view that in Real Americans, specifically the character of Lily in case you have read that book too, is just so easily swayed by the white people around her. She just kind of falls flat in terms of observing the world around her, social dynamics. She just points it out and just moves on with her life where I wanted like a little bit more. I don't think disorientation is the counter example of that um, or that it shows how overthinking things can be detrimental to you. In fact, there are moments in disorientation where the character is pointing out that, God, thinking about this stuff is so exhausting, but also I don't think not thinking about it is good enough. I think this actually endows you with the intelligence and the language to speak about what you are going through and feeling. So quite honestly, having reread this orientation, I stand strong in what I think about real Americans. It just, yeah, I'm just glad that that little reading group experience made me give disorientation a second chance and makes me excited to maybe give other books a second chance. I have a few that I'm, you know, thinking about maybe reading again or trying out again. Um, we'll see. Um, but for today, I am just very glad that I gave disorientation a fair second shot. But yeah, I know this review was kind of all over the place. Like, 
disorientation was, <laughs> in all honesty. Um, but I hope if you read it too, you found it at least enjoyable like I did. Um, and if you DNF'd it, that is completely fine too, because I know exactly how you feel too. <laughs> oh, and also just one thing, I don't really agree with what I originally said, that the book was written like a YA book. Don't know what mindset I was in or what I noticed about it the first time that made me think that. Um, because this time, yeah, I didn't really find that at all. <laughs> so it's interesting. I have no idea where that came from, but whatever mood I was in this time seemed to be the right one for me to enjoy this. And yeah, that is it. Thank you so much for watching this mini review. Um, let me know if you've read Disorientation. Did you like it? Did you not? Did you also DNF it like I did the first time? Let me know down below. I'm curious. Yeah, other than that, thank you so much for watching and I will see you all next time. Bye.